We find this morning, once again, Peter wrestling with what it means to be a disciple of Christ. For the last couple of Sundays, we have seen Peter putting himself out there, trying to figure out what does it exactly mean to follow Jesus. And Peter recognizes that the kingdom of heaven is a place of forgiveness. It's a place where God's mercy reigns and his grace is present. And so Peter comes to Jesus, trying to figure out exactly what does it look like to be a forgiven people, a people who offer forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. And so he poses this question to the Lord, and he says, Jesus, should we forgive seven times? And, and I think Peter is being generous here on, on several levels, because it's hard enough to forgive someone just one time, let alone seven times. Maybe they'll wrong you six times and you offer that seventh merciful forgiveness. But also Peter's being generous because in the Jewish law, it was common to offer forgiveness three or four times. But it was unknown to offer seven times. And seven is a holy and perfect number. So in a sense, Peter's coming up to Jesus and he's like, so, so if we follow you, we're supposed to forgive perfectly. We're, we're supposed to, to try to be your agents of forgiveness on this earth. And so Peter thinks he's setting the bar high. He thinks, I've got it this time. Jesus is going to look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But Jesus pushes us when we don't want to be pushed sometimes. He goes, no, Peter, not seven times but 70 times seven times, or 77 times. We really don't know exactly how to translate that word in the Greek language because it's never been used before or since. We know that it has another 70 and that it, it really means a whole lot of times, basically. It's saying however many times you think you need to forgive him, we'll do it more than that. But forgiveness is so hard. Because forgiveness takes us saying, you have wronged me. Your actions are punishable. That what you have done deserves judgment, for you have hurt me. But I am choosing to offer you forgiveness. Because I believe that God has forgiven us. And so we are called to offer that forgiveness to one another. And on this day, as we remember the atrocities of 9-11, it's hard to even really think about forgiveness. Because forgiveness is so hard to offer. Especially maybe when people who you forgive don't want to be forgiven because they don't think they have wronged you. They don't think their actions are worth judge, judgment. They think they are in the right. But if you think about it in our lives, that's what forgiveness is all about. It's about stepping out, making ourselves vulnerable, and saying, you know what, you have hurt me. What you've done to me has been weighing heavily on me. And I'm going to give this over to God. And I'm going to say, take this. Take this from me, and take this from us, God. And I am speaking truth to you that you have been forgiven, that what you have done to me will never weigh heavily over me, that I am freed from the oppression and from the hurt that you have caused me. And I'm not forgiving you to do this wrong to me. I'm not forgiving you so that you may continue to do this. I am forgiving you so that we might find the grace of God, so that we might be made anew, because the new creation begins with an act of forgiveness. On the cross, Christ forgave us and created a new creation. On this day, Christ is forgiving us, creating us anew. And forgiveness requires us to remember. To remember what has happened to us. To remember the pain that others have caused us. And I don't think anyone in here 
who is old enough to remember September 11th could tell you, not tell you where they were. It is as clear as a couple hours ago. Those images, those scenes flashing across our TV. I'll never forget I was walking down my high school hall. I was only a junior in high school. <laughs> Which to me feels crazy that it was 10 years ago. And I remember seeing people, people I love crying. I remember n not knowing what was going on. I remember walking into the cafeteria, I was doing something, and there, on the TV screen, they kept showing those images. And there were people who were terrified. They were covered in dust. I mean, every one of us who's seen it remembers. And you can't take those memories away from us. That security. I, I grew up as a child not of the Cold War. I grew up as a child that, that knew peace. Yeah, we had the Gulf War, but it seemed like it was over before it even began. That we lived in a place where there was no danger. The only danger we could cause was to our own selves. And as long as we did the right thing, everything was going to be okay. And man, that came crashing down that day. And as I drove home, just praising God that my dad was coming home from the bomb plant that he worked at in Augusta, Georgia, that I knew that my family was going to be okay that night because we lived in Aiken, South Carolina, so far away from Washington, D.C., so far away from New York City, from that field in Pennsylvania. That in a sense, we still were safe. But I kept thinking, what would it be like for a 16-year-old to not have their mama or their daddy come home that day? What would it be like for our world to be forever changed. And so I remember sitting there on the hearth in my den. I was young and I am still young, trying to make sense of that day. That why would somebody in their mind, in the name of the God they worship, fly a plane into a building? Why would somebody seek to take innocent lives do this to us? For, for we're a great nation. You know, we think about what we did in World War II and what we had done in the name of peace. And I guess it kind of took this idea that, yeah, we're no longer safe. As, as not only did they kill innocent people, but in a sense they killed our symbols. The Twin Towers, the great symbol of our country's wealth and our country's prestige. The Pentagon the symbol of our security, the symbol of our protection. And that other plane was going after our capital, the symbol of our governance. That this was planned, that this was calculated. This was an act of war. Still to this day, I don't understand why. But as a 16-year-old, I came to the conclusion that all Muslims must be bad people. That if you're not American, that you are wrong. And I carried with that for a couple of years. And I never even thought that maybe I need to pray that these people might come to ask for forgiveness. I never prayed that our world would seek to be able to forgive one another. I just thought that we need to act strongly. And I thought that the Muslims were our next great enemy. I'd heard about the Russians. I'd heard about the Nazis. I'd heard about the British and world history. And I thought, now it's the Muslims. And so I carried that with me for five years. And that weighed heavily on me. And I'll never forget one day at the University of South Carolina, I was taking a religious studies class. And I learned that the professor I loved was going to be shipped to Oklahoma because we were hiring a Muslim to actually teach Islam, a, a radical idea. 
And so I was kind of bitter that they were taking away my favorite professor and bringing in a Muslim. And so I met my professor that next fall. Took a class with him. Actually ended up taking multiple classes with him. And I actually came to understand the Christian faith by being in dialogue with a true practicing Muslim. A person who sought to take the faith seriously. I'll never forget the day that my mom was diagnosed with cancer. I'm sitting there, and as my world had been shaken that day on September 11th, my world was shaken that day that I found out that all wasn't right. I didn't have any Monday morning classes, and I just remember sitting in my apartment, not wanting to go out, not wanting to do anything. And so I walk decide I'm going to class, and I grab my book bag, and I walk down Barnwell Street, a crossover, Capstone, I make my way through kind of the historical part of the campus, and I find my class on Sufism. It's a type of Islam. And I sit through that class, and I don't even really remember paying any attention. I just remember everything going through my head. And I go up to Professor Alan Asari, and I told him, I don't know what to tell anybody. I don't know what this will look like for the coming weeks or months, but I want you to know that where I stand and what has happened. For the next, it felt like eternity. He sat there, and he put his arm around me, and he recited the Quran. It's not our holy scripture. It's what they hold up as Holy Scripture. And he cited verse after verse after verse of healing verses. Of praying for my mom, praying for my family, praying for the doctors. And in that moment, I didn't know how someone in the name of God could fly those planes into our Twin Towers. And I started thinking that what they did, I was convinced, was not in the name of God. What they did was out of hatred. Because Elena Sari showed me that people of God care about one another. That people of God love one another, that they embrace each other, and they say that this is not going well. And what we found out of September 11th is we found a lot of pain, but the stories about those terrorists were outweighed by the stories of those firefighters, those policemen, those civilians who took the time and risk their life to save others because they knew it is right to care for one another. They knew it was right to risk what we have so that others may be safe. And so we as a community know that we're called at all means to risk what we do because we have a God who has shown us abundant grace. A God who pours out his love more than we could ever imagine. This, this parable we read today is so fitting because we have a king who's settling his accounts. A king who says, okay, I need to make everything right. And so the, I imagine the first person he calls is this slave that owes 10,000 talents. I want to know, does anybody know how much 10,000 talents is worth? I really didn't know how much 10,000 talents was worth. Now I found out that one single talent is worth 10,000 years of labor. Or 15, no, 15 years of labor. Let me get my math straight. I'm, I'm a religious studies major. Huh? So it's worth 15 years of labor. And so 10,000 talents is worth 150,000 years of labor. For me, that's six 
billion dollars. Let me say that again. Six billion dollars. That is an absurd amount. Who in their right mind would loan that amount of money? And who in their right mind would want to take that much money on their own? And so this parable begins with just Jesus shaking the disciples and saying that there's a absurdity going on. But the true absurdity happens when that guy comes forward and looks at the king and says, I can't pay this. He doesn't say that, but we know that's what he's saying. But he drops to his knees and he pleads for forgiveness. Forgive these debts. I'll try to pay them back, but we know he can't pay them back. And as quick as the king shows his rage, he forgives him. And he says, not only am I forgiving you of these debts, I'm saying you're not even my slave anymore. Go and enjoy freedom. And so that slave, feeling great, leaves the court. And immediately he sees someone who owes him a hundred denarii. It's about a hundred days worth of wages. A good amount of money, but nothing in comparison to what he was just forgiven. And he grabs this guy by the throat, and he shows him no mercy. And he says, pay for this. And the guy says verbatim what he said to the king. And he doesn't care. And he throws him in jail. And the other slaves are appalled. I, I'm appalled by this. That someone who's been forgiven so much can show such hatred and anger. And so the slaves go to the king. And the king goes, you wicked slave, how dare you? How dare you take the gift of forgiveness and defile it? How dare you make forgiveness nothing? Because see, forgiveness changes us. When we ask God to forgive us, we're asking God to take us as we are. To take us as people who hurt one another. People who have done terrible things and to forgive us and to change us and when we forgive others that that is freeing them to experience God's grace and so the story of the parable is that God lavishly offers us forgiving grace and we're supposed to take that grace and forgive it with one another with our brothers and sisters in the church. So then what does it look like? Do we as the church have the power to forgive those who have done something in the name of another religion? Do we even have the right to be able to stand here this day and to offer forgiveness to people who might not be wanting forgiveness? I can't answer that question. But all I can answer that as we as a community are called to forgive one another. We as a community are called to drop on our knees every night and plead to God that he will forgive us so that we might be renewed and created in God's image. And we believe that when we forgive that the power of God is present. We believe that when we forgive one another, that the inbreaking of God's kingdom is shining forth. And we believe that that power of forgiveness is greater than any power of evil that fills this earth. We believe that when we forgive others in the name of Jesus Christ, that God will conquer all. And so on this day, on September 11th, 10 years removed, we as this church, and I challenge all of the church, are called to forgive each other unconditionally. And we are called to show that forgiveness that God has first shown us in such tangible and powerful ways that as when I encountered a Muslim that I knew that he loved God. And so that when Muslims encounter us, that they know that we love God, that we love one another, 
and that we are willing to forgive. Because I believe personally that if we take our job as the church seriously, that we hold the forgiveness of God in our midst, that love conquers all. That no act of war, no politician, no government, nothing has the power of the forgiveness of God. And when we live into that, we will meet God in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.